first inaugural, no, our inaugural and first event of our 2017-18 series, Crossings and Boundaries. Um, be sure to pick up a flyer and other uh, tasty publicity on our table. This is for next week's talk, which is here at the same time on Thursday. Lisa Masseri of Yale University will be giving a talk called Interstellar Crossings, the image of exoplanets and the imagination of other worlds. So please do come. So now to the wonderful matter at hand. Um, as you well know, um, it's clear that not only in the IUC, but across campus, uh, interdisciplinarity is an integral, an integral part of the work being done. It's evident in our academic offerings, in our graduate programs, in new places like the library's interdisciplinary research collaboratory, which is now the home for data-centered research support. Um, people talk about it. Lila Roop, feminist studies professor and interim dean of social sciences, talked about the ease of movement across disciplinary boundaries that's characteristic of UC Santa Barbara. Josh Schimmel, professor of evolution and ecology and marine biology, has said that the greatest thing about being a scientist at UCSB is that disciplinary boundaries do not really exist. And in fact, interdisciplinarity leaves California shores. It's gone to places like the Channel Islands where the Biocultural Diversity Working Group which has done research into the interactions between humans and their environment over long periods of time, has said that they did this work in order to demonstrate the importance of interdisciplinary research. So obviously, I could go on and on. My point is that it's really in the campus DNA. However, there's something that is not, that is not necessarily in everybody's DNA on campus, but which is, I dare say, in I don't mean to be speaking so genetically about all of this. I'm saying <laughs> we're talking about boundaries and crossing. So anyway, um, what is really singular about humanists, I want to say, and I think as we will see today, is that we not only practice interdisciplinarity, of course, we think about the meaning of interdisciplinarity. We think about how we do it, what the challenges are, what the possibilities are, we are self-reflexive. And so, I thought that for the first event of Crossings and Boundaries, it would behoove us and stimulate us and engage us to learn from four of our most innovative interdisciplinary scholars about what it means to do this kind of work. And that's what we are going to talk about today. We're going to reflect upon what interdisciplinary means to them in this present moment. So here is our plan. We are going to hear from our four speakers, whom I will introduce in a moment. Very briefly, they will make a short presentation about what they do. And then we're going to have a conversation. We're going to have a conversation that moves around five, just so you have a map, five basic questions. I hope they will evolve in terms of their complexity. And then we will open up the conversation to all of you. And our panelists are, um, first, Elizabeth De Palma Digasser, known as Beth to many, uh, who is the department chair and a professor of history. Beth is one of the world's leading authorities on early Christian thought, and her work is situated at the intersection of religion and philosophy with Roman politics and the process of religious conversion in late antiquity. I'm not going to say a lot because they'll be presenting themselves. Next, we will hear from Layla Shireen Sacker, who is an assistant professor of film and media studies and a faculty affiliate in the <coughs> feminist, studies, feminist studies department. Here at UCSB, she has co-founded Wireframe, a new digital media studio that supports critical game design, we'll see there are crossings, data visualization, VR augmented realities, digital arts, and activism. Then we'll hear from Jeremy White, a continuing lecturer in the history of art and architecture. Jeremy, or Jerry, is an architectural historian and a licensed architect 
and you will also learn about what else he does or what he does within the context of these areas. His field of study is the modern landscape, urbanism, and the architecture of the United States. He also teaches art history in the MFA program at the Brooks Institute. And finally, we will hear from Brandon Whitted. Uh, Whitted? Whitted? Whitted. Oh, Whitted. 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 We have white and whited. And uh, Brandon is an assistant professor of theater and dance. He is a dancer and a choreographer. He has danced professionally in New York City. He's toured internationally. He's also worked in musical theater as both a performer and a choreographer. So now, without further ado, let me invite, uh, let's, we said we were going to start with Beth to give her a few minutes presentation. OK. I will do it. I don't have PowerPoint, although maybe I should have. Um, I am also not the department chair anymore. That's what that's oh, really yeah. yeah, that's why yeah. it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a historian of late antiquity, which is the period from about the second century CE to about 800. And in particular, I study the Christianization of the Roman Empire, or what used to be called the Christianization of the Roman Empire. And um, my current project is one that seeks to understand really how, um, first, how Christian, Christianity came to be the religion that the Emperor Constantine adopted and then promoted, and uh, second, what the ramifications of that were. Now, that seems very ordinary, but I'm going at it from a slightly oblique perspective. Um, Constantine, the first Christian emperor of Rome, spent the early years of his reign in the city of Trier, which is now in Germany. And that was the decade when he decided to become a Christian, and that was a region which really had been in a lot of turmoil before he and his father had come to the throne. Nevertheless, after he, after he moved gradually east, kicking out other emperors on the way to become sole emperor of the Roman state, Gaul never revolted, and it was always a peaceful um, area for him and his family. And so it seemed to me that there was something going on in Gaul, something about what I'm calling the religious topography of the place, that clicked with Constantine. And that maybe we could understand this process and some of the puzzles of his reign uh, by looking more closely at the terrain of Gaul. One of the things that's always puzzled people about Constantine was that he, on the one hand, was the first Christian emperor, on the other hand, really seemed very fond of the solar cult. Um, and never, you know, especially in the early part of his reign, never gave, uh, gave up the solar iconography. Uh, his speeches are full of the use of light as a divine metaphor. When he goes to Constantinople, which he modestly named after himself, he erects a big statue of him as the sun, himself as a sun god. And so it seemed to me that maybe the area of Gaul held some of the secrets to this. And so what I've done is I have started some field work in northwestern France and uh, northeastern France, northwestern Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, mm, borderlands region, um, looking at uh, little local museums for artifacts of religious practice from the third century. And I am now putting them on a map and uh, digitizing the project. And what I've discovered is that not only are there a number of Christian communities in this area that we thought we never really paid attention to, but also this area has the single most, the single densest concentration of sanctuaries to Mithras, also known as Sol Invictus, also known as the sun god, who was a really popular uh, deity to the Roman military. And when you map all of this and you look at the co connections between these places and, and the capital of Trier, you start to understand how some of the ambiguity of his presentation makes sense in this environment. The second half of this project will then look at uh, the reception of these ideas in this part of the world over time. So um, I'm looking at how uh, subsequent, subsequent Germanic kings like Clovis uh, looked at Constantine as a role model, um, uh, patterning their own self-presentation after his, all the way up through the Crusades, 
and, and, and the idea of this divine warrior conquering the beast of darkness that Constantine ultimately advertised himself to be. So it's a project that draws on material culture, digital humanities, rhetoric, looking at the texts and propaganda, numismatics, religious theology, politics, and so on. So. Yeah. All right. Layla, let's all move so Layla can make her presentation. So I, hello everybody. <laughs> Um, I want to thank uh, the Susan and Aaron for this conceiving of this really exciting uh, way to kick off an exciting series this year. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, oh, there's no, it's not on. Okay, now I'll be on. So the title, I'm going to give, I've been told I have five minutes. I turn on my stopwatch. Um, it's okay, I'm timing you. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm going to time me too. So, I'm going to introduce myself as, um, there we go. I'll introduce myself as VJ Om Emma. That's my data body. What is a data body? Ricardo Dominguez says a data body is your credit score, it's your GPA, it's your, <clears throat> your financial records, your social security card, and that has actually more legal uh, weight than your real body, which is uh, decorated with all kinds of colors and genders and stuff. Okay. So just to map out a little bit about my work, I'm going to sort of put forth a couple ideas and not really talk about my, necessarily what I'm doing. But my academic genealogy started in English literature, then I moved into do an, an MA in Arab studies, which was more in the social studies and social sciences, so to speak out of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And then I went and did my MFA in Digital Arts and the Media and the Division of Arts at UC Santa Cruz. And then I did a PhD in Media Arts and Practice at a cinema school. So that's my academic genealogy. And I think I don't, you know, to say interdisciplinary is, is exciting. Um, and I claim them all. <laughs> Um, so the uh, the mode of uh, my the mode of production, what I actually do is design. I started out as a web designer, and to, if you want to think a little bit about my method, my methods have been technological. So I started out doing web design and getting into databases for websites. My SQL, and then that grew into an application stack, and now I'm using Eucalyptus, which is a cloud. Uh, server here on, on UCSB. Uh, on the visual end, I was doing video production and graphic design on print, and that grew into doing live editing and building sort of algorithmic patches, and then now I'm doing VR work in Unreal, Houdini, and Grasshopper. So those are the methods. Traditionally, we've had these two cultures uh, that sort of dominating our, our social and cultural education system sciences and the humanities, right? We can all agree on that. <clears throat> Design is sort of the conception of, of, of realization of new things, innovation. It's the synthesis of both form and content. And as a lot of design theorists have noted, and which I will not necessarily agree with, that it's a um, process for solving problems that use both artistic and scientific practices. And at its core, its language is modeling. So while in the sciences, the language is numeracy, in literacy, in the humanities, it's literacy, the language of design is modeling. So Nigel Cross, uh, he was at the Royal College of Art and Design <coughs> in the uh, late 70s and the 80s. He wrote this famous book, I'm sorry, not a book, it's a little short report called The Designerly Ways of Knowing. This is the same time that John Berger was doing Ways of Seeing. So um, he was called to do a research project in 79 to sort of study the state of educate, design and education. And he came up with the idea that there are these three, uh, that there are these three areas, science, humanities, oh, and design. Did you see what just happened there? The S went down there, that's really funny. So those are the three areas. And his, um, this is basically what he uh, writes in his, in his designerly way of knowing. He says, all right, so in the sciences we study the natural world, 
Arts and humanities was study human experience, which can be painful for many people. And then <laughs> design, we study the artificial world, really um, products and things and objects. Primary method uh, in the sciences, controlled experiment, classification analysis, which I do a lot of. Uh, in the arts and humanities, the method is analogy and evaluation and metaphor, also used. But in design, the primary, me the primary method, not the only method, is pattern formation and synthesis, kind of what Beth was talking about earlier. And I just want to, you know, the, the value of each sort of discipline um, or what they're working towards is really interesting to me. I think the fact that the sciences are working towards truth, arts and humanities towards justice, and in design, it's appropriateness, uh, designing what is appropriate for the moment. For example, I'm out of time. Is that okay? Okay, well, I just want to give you an example of what my mother said. So, my, so like if you're going to, if you're invited to a wedding and the wedding is at night, sorry, if you're invited to a wedding and your wedding is during the day, it is inappropriate to wear an evening dress, even if it's a wedding. You wear a more Sunday dress, church type thing, right? That's appropriateness, even though they're both weddings and they're fancy, so to speak, okay? So that's the difference, that's what I'm talking about, appropriateness versus... Right. So this is this is thinking. This design thinking comes from Nigel Cross's work. In 2011, he published this book, and it's really interesting. I like the the process, and it's pretty true. This is the design iterative process where you start with this empathetic um, point of view, and then you define the problem. Usually, the problem is very ill de ill defined, and then you ideate, and then you prototype, and then you test the prototype, and you keep going back and forth. So the problem with that is that this mode has been co-opted and used mainly in the business model. And this is what has happened to product and artificial design. I mean, it's been completely co-opted by, by, by co the commercial model. So I ask you, my position, what if you, what if you are networks of revolutionary Arab women, Arab techies, and your designing culture. Fantastic way to end your So, 
Uh, right now, I'm, uh, I'm kind of doing those second of two things, but architecture is never that far away either. So what I'm going to do first is instead of talking about me, I'm going to spend uh, about two minutes talking about uh, the board game market. Um, now Layla, is, I think, knows a lot about um, video games and so on, because you are, looks like you are busy subverting many of the norms there, which is very important to do. Um, so maybe this is a good, a good connection here, um, because in a way there's a big divide between the board game and the digital game market. Board game market obviously uh, is much older, um, and in the 90s it looked like it was going to die because of video games, but it didn't. It actually has grown quite a bit. Um, in the last four years or so, the growth has been 20% each year or more, depending on how you measure it. Uh, right now, the market is worth about $1.4 billion a year. So it's really exploded. It's really huge. Um, and it seems like as the video game market grows, so does the board game market. But the board game market probably will always be um, the uh, smaller of the two markets, sort of the sad stepbrother of the two. Um, the board game market has changed quite a bit in the past 20, 30 years or so. Uh, in the 1990s, starting in the 1990s, um, something of a renaissance, as it's referred to, which gives you a very uh, Eurocentric point of view, which the, board, which the board game market definitely is. That's one of its problems, I would say. Uh, but there was a very strong market, a nucleus of a market in Germany, which then got ported into the United States, where it just it finally got some traction, and now it is really quite large. If you go to Kmart or Target or Walmart, you can find um, basically games that you never encountered when you were um, when you were a child, at least if you are 30 years old or more. Um, things like Ticket to Ride is the new Monopoly. Um, there is a deep hatred for games like Monopoly amongst uh, many board gamers, I would say the vast majority I ever encounter. Uh, but the components have changed. Um, there has been considerable innovation in the board game market. Uh, its growth, uh, you know, college students, kids on this college, I encounter them all the time who are enthusiasts about games such as this one. Um, gaming collecting is just really become a thing. People, there are social media sites where people were show and tell not only their games, uh, they will videotape themselves gaming. They do that with video games as well, but showing your, your basically your gaming den is, is now become a thing. So the collecting, this is of course part of the market. The topics are really quite varied. Uh, the game on the right was published by, was designed by a couple high school kids who just wanted to piss people off and they have basically made quite a bit of money. This thing is incredibly popular. Um, some of these games can be quite serious. Uh, what I just showed you was a series of, I would say, fairly frivolous games meant to simply entertain, pass the time, structure conversation. Um, but there are more serious ones. This one is very grim. This one is looking at a, basically you and your teammates. You're all on the same side. It's a cooperative game. You're supposed to stop a pandemic from wiping out the world. Um, there are variations of that where you could be a terrorist trying to wipe out the world. Uh, there's more, some of these games can be quite complicated. They could take, instead of 45 minutes or a half hour to play, uh, take a drive, for instance, Probably the most popular takes about 40 minutes or so. This one could take you two to three hours. Some will take more than that. Uh, but this is all about insurgency and counterinsurgency designed by a former CIA uh, operative uh, who's also a history buff. Um, basically, this is a four-player competitive game. Uh, one of you is going to be Fidel Castro and his buddies trying to uh, make a new Cuba. Um, this one uh, deals with uh, drug cartels um, in uh, Central and South America. Um, takes about two to three hours to play, assuming you know the rules. This one was at a gaming convention in Phoenix. Um, this one takes about 20 hours to play. Uh, you need four people or so. I suppose you could do it by yourself, but this is World War II trying to refight the war. 
Um, it's, you know, gaming has gone in interesting directions. This is a, uh, this is a fellow by the name of Marco Nato at uh, Indiana University. He's not only a gamer, but he has, he's one of many people who's created a website uh, where he basically just reviews games. He's also writing about games as well. So there is some, uh, the board gaming, and he does only uh, board games, but it has come into academia. Um, the market, of course, has grown in other, maybe you recognize this young gentleman, or he's not so young anymore, but he used to be on one of the Star Treks, but he has a YouTube channel that, you know, each episode gets watched by about five million people. There's two million subscribers. Basically, all he does for an hour is he invites people to play games with him, and they're all board games. This is where he lost that ticket to ride. And the people he invites are models and movie stars. Uh, there are gaming conventions that are very popular. Uh, this one happens once a year. It's been going on for about 50 years, but only in about the last 20 years has it gotten this many numbers. For three days, about 45,000 people or so convene to look at the latest games. Uh, publishers will target um, their publications for this convention called Gen Con. There's a one that's three times as large in Germany called Essenspiel, which happens once a year. They have about 700 games published uh, at that convention. And uh, to be published at the convention or to come out then is, is, can be very important for your market share. And this is showing one view of that convention. Um, there are cruises uh, devoted entirely to gaming where you basically get on a ship with folks and you spend all day, I suppose, a night uh, as the ship tootles around and you're playing games and I guess you get off to do some shopping and then you come back, uh, maybe fishing. Now, um, in recent years, I've been doing some game designing myself, board games. I've never really gotten into video games for a variety of reasons. Um, so I've always been, I don't know, I'm very interested in the tactile quality, so I've been publishing some games uh, with a California company. Um, and I tend to design on the more complicated side. Like these games, you know, the, this one here probably takes about six hours to play, depending on which scenario you play. Um, you know, from the feedback I've gotten on social media and so on. But, there's a combination of things that are going on here. They're, they're steeped in history. It, it takes a particular historical event, usually military history. Um, although some of my games uh, deal with civil rights, with the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, but the ones that seem to be more popular than military history. Basically, this is a these, the gaming experience, and this is a solitaire game. I don't okay. It. okay. It, can, it can it can also be done cooperatively. Um, it mixes reenactment with uh, planning. Um, and one of the things that, um, that, that I try to do in these games is, you know, I, in, in some, since I'm out there in the market, it can be very difficult to subvert when you are on the other side of that boundary, not in academia. Because, you know, subversion works very well in a gallery, but it doesn't work so good in a game store. So I try to find more subtle means. For instance, in this case, you know, um, when you play a game like this, you don't win or lose, unlike most games. Um, so instead, I borrowed from academia and used the concept of outcomes. If you've had to deal with WASP accreditation, for instance, you had to deal with outcomes. So uh, for instance here, this is basically just a, uh, a debriefing chart, as it were, at the end of the game to see to try to give a little bit of narrative closure, to try to add a kind of narrative experience instead of just telling the player they've won or lost. And in that way, try to bring in um, some other ideas and, and deal with some other criteria. Um, and then one last thing. Last thing. The last thing, I swear. Um, and since I've been here, I've been asked to uh, teach uh, an architecture history, of course, which is my background, to teach architectural drawing, which I do. Uh, but lately, the department has asked me to teach uh, a survey of game history. So now I'm becoming a game historian, which has been uh, very enlightening, because unlike when I had to learn art history at another institution, 
Um, there was already a very strong discipline there, but in game history, the discipline is really fragmented. So this makes me feel, I don't know, I feel like uh, I am crossing boundaries all the time because there is no discipline, single discipline for me to step into. Thanks. I have a dance play version to microphones, so we don't often have to uh, speak. <laughs> um, so um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I'm mainly working currently in um, dance performance and creative research, um, and, and how it, that kind of intersects with dance studies and the sort of theoretical and historical um, frameworks of that, um, that intersection. Um, I come from a conservatory background, so really focused on performance and choreography. Um, in contemporary dance specifically. Um, I also had a very kind of early history in theater, um, both in acting training and musical theater performance and eventually working up to choreography through the ranks as we do, dance captain, assistant, and so on. Um, but you know, conservatory training kind of makes those uh, pluralities um, a little less possible, so I really started to gear myself towards dance, um, which felt a little more um, time sensitive <laughs> in my early years. And so I, um, before moving to New York City for my career, I was really just um, looking at kind of the form formative, traditional forms of modern dance specifically, and then how those intersect. Um, in my career in New York City, I was dancing with uh, Shen Wei Dance Arts primarily. And he is a, um, Shen Wei is originally from China, and uh, look into the United States and New York City specifically, and really has this beautiful way of blending visual arts, um, Eastern and Western perspectives on movement and performance, um, and which kind of, um, I guess, infiltrate all levels of his aesthetic and creative and even process um, uh, based research. So they, it, whether or not my affinity for in, interdisciplinarity led me there, or whether it you know, helped, that kind of helped unlock something, maybe it's a little bit of both, I, I'm not sure. Um, but along the way, um, as a male dancer in the field, I really started to locate a sense of, um, of otherness as a male in a, in a field that kind of is a, um, often considered a feminized um, field specifically inside the arts, which is also often feminized in general in terms of culture. And so this sense of where where am I, where's my identity, and, and that kind of intersecting what's my identity as a gay man growing up in North Carolina, um, being a displaced Yankee from New York, moving there when I was 10, this kind of um, just how geography actually affects our, um, our perspective um, and how that you might locate the rub um, that you have with your with identity in terms of expectation. And so that really kind of has just percolated through both my training and my research later on. And then while I returned to, in my return to grad school, I really focused a lot on um, the men's and masculinity studies aspects of, that, of those considerations. And am now currently trying to keep that going in terms of how that intersects with performance, um, dance specifically um, in a performance performative and choreographic research format, um, and then also try to engage um, through scholarship to kind of continue that discussion and keep asking questions. So those frameworks kind of feed my research in, um, in the creative uh, realms that exist, and then also kind of zoom back in and try to uh, keep that in a reflexive way. Um, I have kind of two paths currently, so I'm, I'm looking at that really from a, the choreographer standpoint. How do I engage in um, representations, identity, um, embodiment um, in relation to a range and a variety of masculinities <laughs> as a plural, not as a kind of singular concept, and who and when those, you know, those qualities are um, defined or redefined and reconsidered. Um, and then on the other kind of track of my own uh, current research, I'm do, um, it's rooted more in performance and how performance and choreography intersect through um, collaborative embodied research, usually drawing a lot on improvisation techniques and specifically um, site-specific performance. So really engaging with alternative spaces that take you off of the proscenium, off of the stage, and have more relationship with audience directly. Um, so I have two different 
projects in that realm as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Understand, really understand less content but more structurally the interdisciplinarity of your work and specifically how you experience the place of your work in your discipline. If there is a point or a discipline with which you identify or, or whence you launch yourselves, sort of the interdisciplinarity in relation to the place or where you place yourselves in relation to your dominant or trained discipline or disciplines. That's the first part. And the second part, <coughs> from that place, how do you think about your methodological skills? <coughs> so the place from where you launch in terms of the interdisciplinary of your work, how you understand that place in relation to inter interdisciplinary, and then the methodologies understood in relation to that place, or absence. So who's starting this off? Start. I would say, as an ancient historian trying to understand a past that is like a jigsaw puzzle with three quarters of the pieces gone. Um, a game, yeah, a game. Um, it always struck me that I couldn't just pay attention to one particular discipline, um, that I would have to necessarily draw on a lot of different approaches. And um, I was surprised to find that that really wasn't the approach uh, of many scholars of antiquity who had adopted a kind of 19th century Rockian sort of historicist perspective. And so right at the very beginning, um, I was sort of crashing into borders in, in, a, in, in a pursuit that I thought was sort of going to be free. And mot motivated also by you know what you brought up, which I never really articulated to myself before, but but this sense of a quest for justice as being underlying the humanities. Um, at the very beginning, I was really consumed with the idea of, of religious tolerance as opposed to religious violence. In fact, I still am. And, and that put me into the field of late antiquity. And, and, and I found also that, the, the, that the, the, the white men who had formed my discipline were not at all interested in the dialogue between past and present and crossing that frontier. And so I think that from the very moment I began doing what I did, I was always out of place. <laughs> well, right? uh -huh. I, could, I could jump onto that if I could turn on the mic. It's so funny on the tech. You cannot handle my microphone. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's very weird. It's true. It's not virtual enough. It's too material. Um, <laughs> but I was going to say just a couple of things that you made me think. First, um, but I also want to respond to your question, so I'll respond quickly. Um, which is sharing a spirit. Um, so um, the the they're enjoying this. <laughs> no, this is better. So the seriously the. Um, can you ask your question again? Sorry. I was asking how you under, oh, my question was yeah. what you said, the interdisciplinarity of your work in terms of the place from where you launch, where you go, and the methods or skills that you're... Right, you're definitely out of place. And so out of place makes me think of Edward Said and his work. Um, it's actually the name of his autobiography, which he wrote way after Orientalism. And it's a, it's a place uh, that many other thinkers before him have articulated, which is the place of inside and outside the other, but also um, you know, being in and out. And I think that's what we're talking about in terms of our disciplines, right? And I, that I, that's why when I presented what I did, I hesitated saying that I really come from anyone, because I do see the work to be necessarily interdisciplinary. I just don't have, personally, I don't really believe in tr one truth. So there is that in science, although I'm good at technology, but, mm. and then, um, I, I get the design and the importance of innovation and getting, all, getting that appropriate, uh, uh, the appropriateness of it, and I really enjoy that, I get that. However, it's been co-opted by the uh, businesses and by the marketplace, and that's why I find myself at home in the humanities. I do find myself at home in the arts and humanities because 
of its self-reflective reflexiveness, its, its sense of the rhetorical nature, as well as the, um, the question or the, the desire to look towards uh, some sense of justice, I just find the human experience extremely painful. Okay, um, for me, we can go out of order if you want. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to be linear. <laughs> just, just talk, just talk. Yeah, so just, um, for me, I think there's, I, I, it's hard for me to think of an aspect of my work that isn't interdisciplinary in the sense that uh, if you ask any, well, I guess the, the question of discipline versus genre, right? So in, uh, if you ask any one person what is contemporary dance or what does it encapsulate, right? Um, they'll tell you probably something different or this in relation to that. Um, so really the, the kind of overriding um, consideration of contemporary dance is hybridity and really looking at how um, different the traditions kind of hold up the form while also intersecting with more theatrical forms and multimedia and intermedia um, incorporating text and vocal performance and you know all different layers that might happen depending on your style. Um, now we see a lot of intersections of genre with hip hop and social dance and, and these other forms kind of re-combining uh, um, after they've kind of been parsed out for, for a while. Um, and I think that the other aspect really just from, in a broad sense of my work that's interdisciplinary is the the model of, of the practices research model. So really kind of uh, that flux between doing and making and generating creative output versus um, right. the, the theorizing and the, and the scholarly output, right? Or, or input <laughs> um, in terms of research. And so um, that kind of middle ground of praxis where it's, it's all really reflexive in that way, um, I think also kind of lends itself in terms of the discipline of you know, research in those different different models. Um, and then of course, gender studies intersecting with dance, which then usually, as we might talk about later with pedagogy, right, how does that then make you consider how you yourself are perhaps reproducing these kind of heteronormative, heterosexist um, systems um, in the classroom because it's rooted in such traditional right, uh, perspectives. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where where it lies, and then um, currently it's intersecting more with visual arts as well, and how um, in those sectors it works. Where there's always there's a visual art component that comes in, and how how does that medium point to the body, point to embodiment or trace of the body that kind of remains, um, which is in, in process. Yeah. And then I think just to answer the methods question um, specifically in regards to masculinities, I. Um, I've continually, um, when working with a group of dancers, found that um, interview processes and um, discussion are really important for that work to be able to kind of mine their own experiences and their own identities and sense of um, how they see themselves and how they believe other people see them. Um, and then to try to communicate that through and not just have my, own, my voice and my experience uh, on the stage in its representation. So, well, okay, Jerry, let me ask another question that maybe you can start us off. On the one hand, what I'm hearing is that there's a kind of freedom and exhilaration within the academy, if you will, in being able to move back and forth. And yet, Beth, you've encountered resistance in among more traditional advocates of certain lines that should not be crossed, things that should not be joined. Although I'll also note, maybe we can come back to this, that synthesis seems to be something that figures in your work. But what I was going to say is in this part, or in this question, or ask about, there are, and maybe for you it's more internal, um, whereas for the three of you, it sounds like there are some disjunctions or resistances or tensions that develop when you talk about the border between the academy and broader culture or cultural context. And could you talk about that? Maybe sort of the challenges you encounter as you make these crossings, whether they're in, within the institution or between the academy and other publics, other uh, markets, other audiences, um, other constituencies. 
Yeah. And other genders. I mean, so what is the, and then this one we didn't talk about, but in talking about those tensions and crossings, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I wonder what's occurring to me is whether you ever think about the difference between bricolage or sort of a kind of borrowing that itself might be problematic or uh, coercive in any way. So, yeah. <clears throat> In other words, in this freedom to borrow and choose, is there something that's being lost or challenged? So the borders and the tensions you encounter, um, yeah. Well, I think there is something, um, something very exciting about the creativity involved in just crossing from one discipline to another. Um, I mean, I can't imagine looking back doing anything than doing that. Because I know, you know, when I was getting my um, doctorate, in architecture and history, there is, you know, it's already kind of bifurcated. Uh, there are those who will study architecture for the high art, for the monumentality of it, for its representational quality, but then there's a whole other branch that don't get it well along with the other branch, which is embraces the everyday space, um, you know. So there is this constant, you know, even within the one discipline, and I'm sure this is true of all the other disciplines represented here, that there are already those boundaries. Uh, I preferred, I just naturally kind of was crossing between those anyway. Because you can learn from one, when you, when you cross, you, you take a point of view and you encounter another point of view, or it could be tools or, you know, uh, it's incredibly just, useful. I mean, it's a learning experience to do that. So for the eternal student, you know, that move to go think about the knowledge production that you're working on, um, but from a different cultural way of knowing, to go back to the ways of knowing. I think that any one of us, to really know some one, you know, something one way or one method takes like a lifetime to learn. So the discipline is necessary. But then to know that you, to understand that that's not all there is, the human experience is not the only thing. We also have a natural world, and we also have a virtual world, and they're all impacting each other. And to understand that interdependence is so critical. And you need interlocutors who have learned how to traverse all of those crazy, closed-minded places. And they all they exist all over the place, you know. It's just a matter of how much effort one wants people are willing to take to learn something different. I mean, I think everyone is open to learning, especially in this, that's why we're here. Um, but I just want to say one, one thing I wanted to add to in terms of methods is something that I wanted just to bring up. That I, I mentioned this whole Nigel Cross way of design thinking in my 104 class to my students to bring it back to the students really quickly. And I wanted to gauge what kind of you know, education they had had because they had had more opportunity. I think it has something a little bit different than science and humanities. And what was brought up was faith-based education, which didn't occur to me because of my generation in my situation. So it's interesting to me that I think that might be a new way of you knowing. That's another way of knowing. That is a way of knowing. That might be in complete contradiction with the humanities and the sciences, They're, you know, the truth and the fake news and all that craziness. Um, and and who cares about justice and race? <laughs> I mean, like, it seems like a whole liberal project is just attacked by this faith-based way of knowing. And the only thing out there is I mean, I don't know. So it's like a new moment. I think that we are at this new moment. So it's exciting to just be open to grow, but understand that at the same time, there are these deeply rooted cultural ways of human uh, ways of doing things and things and methods of making that are necessary. I think the tension that is created by crossing these kind of disciplinary boundaries is actually quite useful. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you don't have that, yeah. it, it really is, yeah. But it yeah. scares other people too. Right? It does. So, so I think that um, the whole idea of uh, crossing and the moment of making our work more vital is absolutely the case in my field where, you know, Greco Roman history has now been co opted by white nationalists. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so it's given, the moment has given a real urgency. To the kinds of boundaries that many of us have been fighting, you know, for decades, um, and there's very much, I and mean, that's a different kind of.
faith-based approach, and an ideological approach is every bit as faith-based, right? Right. 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 But, but you know, I, I I think we're we're wondering whether we have the right tools to engage with that kind of critique. And, you know, some of the people in my field remain essentialist, but in a different way. So so maybe we do, but it's. It's the moment that's really brought a lot of the, these issues to a head. Um, how we conceive of ourselves as scholars, how we interact with the people who've shaped the field, and what do we do with the, the really burning issues outside. Which has also, I think, um, impacted the way we think about another kind of boundary that we cross, namely the one between ourselves and our students. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how you understand the kinds of bridges you're building. I mean, are your bridges implicitly the bridges based on the quest for social justice as humanists? Are the bridges now, what's the shared terrain across which you are, are building a bridge? Is there a foundation that you can even you know, build your bridge upon to anchor? So what is it like translating your work research into your teaching and your connections really with your students who come with their own uh, forms of knowing. Are you encountering limits, interruptions, possibilities? What are the channels like? Is there a common language? Do you have to build one? How do you talk to your students for, about your work? Um, for me, uh, some, sometimes uh, that border seems kind of either to slide or to really not exist because um, I'm making, uh, that's, you know, I'm making over here uh, on time off or during the summer and then that's in my consciousness as I come back and, and lead a choreography course where I'm advising and kind of creating the steps for them to go through a process um, but also at the same time trying to leave space for the emergence of their own idea of process because th there's no one formula for making dance or performance. You know, some people work completely non-linearly, right? Generating a bunch of material, looking at it, reshaping it, finding meaning, and that's a way forward. Some people know from the outset, like, this is what I'm making, there will be five sections. It's, it's really looking at this, and that's the lens through which they continue along the process, right? And so for me, it's really saying, okay, Guys, this is this was my process in this um, you know in this project, and then my process shifted here, and then over here I was really using improvisatory processes and the collision of you know uh, this interruption of a visual artist that I'm working with. How does their process either you know fit this way or that way with mine, and then what can that reveal about uh, my own that might be limit that I might be limiting myself? So the kind of boundaries we, put, we place on ourselves as makers or, or researchers. Um, and so for me, I think you know, it's really about trying to create the space for them to take ownership of their own. I, I keep gesturing to Johnny because he's sitting up there, but um, one of my students. <laughs> um, for them to take ownership of their own perspective and, and along the way just giving them the tools, right? That then they can kind of access that and then kind of just go, right? And, and whether their process looks anything like mine in the end doesn't really matter, right? It's about it's kind of giving them, giving them um, permission to find that. So if there's, if there's anything in, um, in our dominant culture today um, that reeks of injustice, I think it's the kind of um, imperial system that in some ways, in many ways, we inherited from the Roman, um, the Roman Empire, right? In terms of European law, in terms of understandings of slavery, in terms of how religion affected all of this. And and if you think about world history, as I teach um, my lower division classes, it's one of the dominant themes in world history. And yet, when I teach my classes, this is this is less and less the case. But the border between me and my students is that people on campus don't necessarily see this history as their history, right? And so the challenge has been to get, you know, a class that reflects the student body of UCSB and that reflects the, student, the, the population of California in my class because what I really want to do is, is help them excavate their culture 
and help them understand how what they seem to what they seem to inherit is natural, whether it's attitudes toward women or whether it's attitudes to Jews or to Arabs or to Islam, is not at all natural, but it's it's conditioned by a particular context. So I think the great challenge for me is finding those students who who then will be in that class, who then we go on this project. Have you shared that or is that been the had that experience in your classes? I mean, I know lately you were talking about some challenges. I think we were talking earlier or at lunch about, they said, well, don't you sort of share the common digital parlance with your students, right? And you said, no. no. <laughs> and that surprised me. Yeah. yeah. No. And I think that has to do with the fact that, um, well, I think that has to do with the fact that this is that of the arts and the humanities. Mm -hmm. And it's not been traditionally what we've studied is the digital is, is rather, relatively new to this field, to this discipline. Um, and I think that also um, there's a difference between graduate students and undergraduate students um, and what they're looking for. The graduate students come and they are more interested in our department to search for critical thinking and, and critical studies and they want the theoretical foundation. And what I'm trying to teach is this design. My method is the iterative design method, but I just showed you that nice little back and forth and back and forth and trying to teach them how to make, plan, design, conceive of something, plan it, execute it, have it work or fail, and then learn from it and put in new ideas and move again. Um, but this is very challenging for students who haven't had that kind of education because for them, they, they're terrified. There's just too much of anxiety, and they they think that that I'm making them redo an un, a non-existent project. They don't understand how to how to make bring it into existence. I'm trying to teach them these methods, but design have these methods haven't been taught. Although what Nigel Cross is saying is that this can, this literacy, this language can be taught to elementary students. Mm -hmm. So this is where my challenge is that I think I'm teaching something that is, is for the 21st century. And the truth is, pedagogy just haven't had me amount to do it. I, mean, I wasn't even raised in those conditions. I graduated from college before the internet. Okay, so, you know, I get it. <laughs> and that's probably why I'm right here, because I really can be, I mean, you know. So there's a kind of anxiety about undoing things, mm -hmm. right? They think it's finished, and you want to say, no, it's that we got part learn. of the stage. And, Beth, you're suggesting that you want them to sort of excavate their culture, sort of undo their points of departure exactly. and question them. And so, so one of the things that we had also talked about, which this is a slightly uh, broader or more abstract question in a way, I mean, I, I want to propose or suggest to you that when some of us were students up here, I'll say, <laughs> of the battle, you know, in the 60s when deconstruction was underway in Europe, and then when it came to the United States in the 70s, and even through the development of subaltern studies and cultural studies, there was a kind of notion that what we might now call interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary study was the calling into question of the notion of an autonomous self-identical subject. That is, the subject was permeated with contextual intersections and competing forces. And I'm wondering whether you have the sense that there's been a move towards re-essentializing the subject. That, in other words, has, do you think that identity politics have influenced the possibilities for interdisciplinary, or at least as, you know, the reception thereof? We'll start with the chuckler. Yeah. I think that in my discipline, the essentialized subject has never disappeared. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in some ways, and I think you know we've been chipping away at it. But but in 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 classics, ancient history, we are sort of the prototypical discipline. We arose in the 19th century. We decided, you know, a, a national uh, nationalist European movement, and we decided that we were going to appropriate the scientific method to understand the past. And there are still people who practice that, even though you know Marxism tried to chip away at it, and and deconstruction. 
So um, I think that um, far from the resurgence of the essentialized self, we still have these people, but we have the tools now to maybe engage with some of the identity politics because they've been owned in that way. And I would say most people in my field do not, uh, do not, have not <laughs> discarded the, the, the idea that, um, that there, are, there is no essential truth in history but many perspectives. Right. Yeah. For dance, um, it's interesting because I feel like the, the kind of trajectory of dance and style and its, and its um, relationship to itself, it, it seems to have kind of evolved at a pace that's different <laughs> than, than other arts. Um, so often, right, the, the notion of modernism versus postmodernism of dance is often kind of counter to what visual arts or theater or other other mediums were doing. Um, so, you know, the emerging modern dance, what, late 40s, 50s, right, this kind of, it's, it was still shaping itself and kind of finding what that is. And it was of a time where illusion and spectacle were still involved as a kind of remnants of ballet, um, which really root making a narrative. You have a libretto, this is the map for that, and we, we dance those, um, those ideas out and, um, and wear costumes in terms of character and all this. And so when you shift into kind of the 60s and 70s for dance, this is when the postmodern turn was happening, you know, it's actually where dance kind of, they were trying to dash all of that off. They were trying to throw away illusion, throw away um, uh, costumes, either literally by being nude or, <laughs> or you know, wearing the pedestrian clothing to, to show that all movement is dance or has the potential to be dance. Um, and how we look at it, how we position it, um, uh, you know, really is, is that how we shape it and conceive of it. Um, so I think, you know, in the postmodern movement, that's really going, okay, mm, let's essentialize this down to what is dance, what does it need to be without all the bells and whistles. Um, and then, you know, 80s, 90s, it's like, it's all getting revved up again in late post late, the late postmodern period, and now into what we would maybe consider contemporary, um, where everything's kind of colliding again. And so, yeah, I think, it, I think it's, um, it's interesting to, to think about, but in that way and to bring it to my students, I think I'm in this place coming in of a different generation um, in academia and going, okay, so this is, my experience has been very hybrid and a lot of my colleagues' experience have been very of uh, a specific modern training that mm -hmm. it was passed down directly and taught is often modified or they're working in relation to two of these forms, right? And so for me, it's, it's, it's about kind of helping my students create a bridge those two ways and say this is super important this is your base this is formative and then this is how we can kind of undo that at certain times um, to kind of find more growth and more opportunity um, <coughs> all right i'm going to ask one final question then we'll open it up so we're flowing we're moving we're making dance dissolve into its other we're we're penetrating borders, we're having fun, uh, we're trying to de-essentialize. So my question is, nonetheless, do you, and maybe you could each speak to this briefly, do you feel there is an other against which you position yourself? Yeah. Is there still a line or a limit, an other, uh, a blind spot? I mean, if you could pair Dr. Keating in your blind spot, but is there an other against are positioning yourself. Yeah, I, I firmly will say no. Um, because the because I ontologically don't believe in good and evil, so I don't think in terms of binary. Mm -hmm. So there can never I always see I see in multi systems, I see design systems, I see interdependence. There is no way that perhaps there are uh, perhaps my way can agitate others, <laughs> and it probably does all the time. But um, but I never position. I'm always looking for the bond. I'm always looking for the symbol. I'm looking for the patterns. I'm seeking out the connections. I don't want the the agitational. Though I'm sure it happens. So 
So I, I yeah, this was about firm. I thought about that. <laughs> I was going to write a few sentences. No. It's a hard one to answer because I'm not sure. It, 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 the word other can be taken, the concept can be taken different ways. But, uh, you know, I, I do feel that, um, at least with the game publishing and so on, that the, the market, especially for history based games, tends to be fairly conservative. Yeah. So, what people will buy a game like that largely to confirm what they already know. So, it, 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 you have to be very quiet and subtle if you're going to go against the grain. You know, which is, what's the point of doing it if you're going to go with it? I mean, you got to go against it. I mean, that's, so I, I kind of feel like it's, a, it's another educational moment, another educational opportunity. You know, here I've learned X, Y, and Z, and you know, see if I can destabilize your stereotype or whatever. I think it's tricky. It gets tricky, but you get to do it. You can do it with the mechanisms. This word design is really, really very good as, as I think, a, a pedagogical or a, you should say a teaching tool because you're, as you design, you do get to know in ways that are very different than any other way possible. And then when you're gaming something, if you are enacting it or participating through a game, um, it's a way for knowledge to creep in, in in different ways without you necessarily even being aware of it. So that's very exciting doing that. Just say it or try to. But there's probably multiple others <laughs> or clusters of others. Right. But, um, um, for me, one other is tradition and kind of conservatism and fundamentalism in that, and what's what someone should or should not do, what men should or should not wear, what how women should or should not act, right? This kind of what we're shooting all over ourselves, right? As yeah. so <laughs> uh, is the phrase I like. So I'm sorry. Um, you know, but this sense of kind of like, oh, what is supposed to be? Um, so I think tradition is one, um, which I think kind of crosses the boundary of, um, of the, the boundary of generational boundaries. I think is is related to that. Um, yeah, and I think <coughs> the other one is economics. <laughs> so in dance, I mean, dance and the arts. I mean, we all know things are being defunded from where they weren't really that funded in the first place. Um, <laughs> um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of kind of shifting uh, sensibilities in performance and production of dance performance, theater performance, um, performance art, purely due to economics and the fact that we can't, we, we can't afford to rent a theater and have a crew and have lights. So we're gonna take it into the streets. We're going to re, you know, situate this into a found space, like a warehouse or something, which also then kind of crosses the boundaries um, with audience as well. And so the kind of audience performer gets well mixed up because everyone's in the same space. So I think sometimes economics plays a role in not only um, creating restrictions, but then uh, opportunity from those limitations. Yeah. I would love to say with Layla that, that I have no other, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's true. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, but... And I think, no, I, do, I like, I like that, that, that vision of, and that idea, potential idea of synthesis, but, but I, you know, listening to you talk about economics and funding and and, and what you have to say too about the market, I, I, I really do think that the other for me is any kind of structure that uh, denies the fundamental equal value of, of other humans. And I think that that's something that, that really, if I think about what I brought, what I wanted to do when I first started doing this and what has re-energized me lately, it's, it's that kind of structure structure that obviously we just see everywhere and is kind of roaring back and that's, I, I, that has to be another, I, you know, I would like to, I would like to subvert it, I would like to bring people who support that structure around, but, but um, I do, I do see it as other. Almost Yeah, exactly. Well, let us invite 
the others into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> questions? We have a, a, a moving mic, so raise your hand. We have questions. May or may not be working. May or may. No? Okay, I think we can. Oh, here's another one. All right. question that is a version of the what is your other what is your, what is your other <laughs> no yes. no no you can't this is like an absolute okay. dead zone here okay um i want them to be able to hear me but i want people here to be able to hear me too okay so uh we'll give it a try um when you for each of you you've probably had the experience of coming up against somebody or some group or whatever that expresses utter bafflement <laughs> at what you do <laughs> every all the time. And, and what's your what's your elevator speech? You know, <laughs> and you have to try to explain to people who have expressed and not necessarily in a hostile manner, but just you know like utter bafflement, like they just can't even begin to wrap their minds around what it is you do and why. I acknowledge it every day. I, mean, I say, you know, people ask what you do, I say a Roman historian, and like the conversation stops. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, you just have to observe it. And then, and then I say, well, that was, you know, one of the reasons I got into it. So I was always puzzled by, uh, you know, why people found this attractive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the best. I the best is to really be a, try to listen to who you're yeah. asking that and tailor it for that particular person. Because part of the problem is that you're, the breadth is just too wide. So you got to figure out is this per, what what where is she coming from and how do I answer her rather than it be about me. It's more about her. In relation to the elevator, I was saying I might have to pull the emergency uh, <laughs> and have a talk. And like, um, but um, you know, I think it's interesting because for from where I'm coming from, which you know, dance in the academy is, is really pretty new as well. We only have like four universities that have a PhD in dance specifically. You know, the masters is masters in fine arts is, is growing and you know in requirement, but also in opportunity. Um, so you know, we used to be in the what, physical fitness or what's the you know, recreation, yeah. recreation, right? Yeah. And so, um, so I think for, for me, it's often the first question of, um, oh, you dance? Do you want to be on Broadway? Do you, you know, these kind of foundational things that most people have an understanding of dance as. Um, and so that's kind of the first barrier. So again, it's listening to the person, kind of where is that line for them? Um, so usually it's explaining first what contemporary dance, or rather what contemporary dance is not. <laughs> right is usually the easier way, um, but then to say, oh, but now you're, but you teach at university, you teach mm -hmm. dance, like, why didn't you play? and then <laughs> and also explain the difference between, you know, theory and research <coughs> and studio practice. <coughs> right, so we're training dancers, but we're also training researchers, and we're doing that ourselves. So I think I think that's a it's a moving target for me in terms of how how do you try and explain. Um, and then to put the masculinity <laughs> question in, right? You know, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's really just then looking at it, going, okay, well, what is masculinity? And if someone can't really say, or they start listing qualities, you go, okay, well, then why do we call it one thing if it's all those things, or if it couldn't be all those things? And then how does that play out in how the body is able to move on stage um, through forms that are often restricted of, uh, or create restrictions on the body? So that's like. Um, that's a great question because I run into that situation all the time since I go in and out of academia. Um, and sometimes the question is, is kind of humor. I find it kind of humorous when it kind of sort of comes up because what they're really asking is, what do you do all day? They're um, you know, it's like, if I give the hint that no one comes busy, she goes to teaching. They just, I can tell very quickly that they think you're busy when you're in the classroom, but when you're not in the classroom, what are you doing? 
You know, I mean, what is there getting? So sometimes it's just that simple. It's so simplistic. Yeah. So then you just have to explain, oh, no, 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 you have to prepare, blah, blah, you know. It's not the usual thing, but I think I have it easier because I teach architecture history. So as soon as you mention architecture, people find that to be very substantial, as opposed to dance, I suppose. You know, where you have to explain the value of your discipline. Right. You know, and then it needs to be taught, that sort of thing. I don't have that problem at all. I can just, you know, I can show it off in a way, and, and I get respect simply by dropping the word architecture. So. Notice that I didn't say anything. Like, historian, dance, <laughs> did you notice? Just wanted to point that out. Is there an importance to labels? How do we negotiate or how do we stake a claim on being either in one discipline and pushing the boundaries of it, or staking a claim and insisting that you're in multiple disciplines? Um, so just to make an example, um, I mean, I, I kind of feel like history does or should incorporate almost everything, not just political and social history, but history of music, history of art, should be, I should be able to do that as a historian. But then, if I'm doing it in a certain way that the art historian is saying, you're not using our methods, you're not an art historian. Mm -hmm. Do uh, how, how do we negotiate uh, stating that like, I am an art historian or letting that go? Is it a meaningless distinction? You know, I per, so I have a, this is a real serious problem. So I build media systems. I design them and build them. I design them. I do a lot of the building. At some point, I need to work with the computer scientists. I need to talk to the scientists, otherwise the thing will not work. I mean, I only have a certain amount of understanding. So there's there. So I have to be able. It's just a need from the of the research to be able to talk to a discipline. It's not about where. It's not. It's again not about me. It's about the thing itself. I. I let the self, I, I personally don't like labels, I like verbs. I'm a verb. I, I think that comes from the designing and making and doing. I, I be things, but I be all kinds of stuff. So I have to do a little bit of scientific work and I have to do some of the artistic subversion. And I, I don't, I mean, I, you see, so I don't, um, I think that it's necessary for the project of building media systems today, you have to go from knowing their natural world all the way to the, the virtual world and everything in between and to be able to negotiate the content and the discussions and the languages. I mean, like the human languages too, <laughs> not just the computer languages. So, um, you know, it's absolutely necessary to work within disciplines. You have to. You have to speak to the, the scientist. You have to know how to speak to the humanities person. When you learn those languages, then that's really, that's the exciting part. But then to say, to put myself in any position, well, I can just, you know, I, I am where I am located. And I, there's a reason for that. I feel at home in this department and because it's extremely interdisciplinary, frankly. And uh, UCSB, too. So I, this, I do feel very much at home here. And I think, though, that it's not necessary for me. I don't feel the need to put these um, limits, but I have to talk to all these people to do my work, whether I you know this is just a practical thing. But to follow up on that question, though, um, I think there is something important, though, about learning method. For instance, if you're going to be an art historian or you're going to study art, um, you don't have to use the methods that have been created in our history, but you should be aware of them so that there is a body of knowledge there that you will benefit from in your study. So for instance, I've known many, my own advisor uh, would you know, dabble in other disciplines, but he was incredibly good at learning those disciplines uh, first, um, or at least along the way. But then he would pick and choose the disciplines, you know, and, and, you know, and there's a lot of power in that. Uh, but there's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of sad to see a, a young scholar kind of decide that they're going to work in a discipline without knowing any of the methods of the discipline itself. Right. 
that can be very problematic. And I would say it's, it's being aware of the methodologies and maybe the theoretical frames that you're using as well. If you, if you can identify the methodologies and the theoretical concepts that you're using, it's that that allows you to jump into, or at least to talk to people in other disciplines because uh, the theoretical perspective, more than anything else, is what you might have in common. Right. Even if your methodologies differ, even if your fields of study differ, if you're applying similar theory, then you can you can start to put your own work in conversation with another. So the, yeah. the it's, it's a lot more work doing that, though, because you know learning more than yes. one discipline, that, <laughs> yes. you know, it takes yeah. enough yeah. just to learn one discipline. Yeah, right. you, exactly. Yeah. That's why we're all of a certain age. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to have three more questions in three minutes. And we're, I'm going to ask one of the panelists to respond only to our last three questions. So I think your hand is up. Hi. So um, my question complements Travis, except I think a lot of the discussion has been about the interdisciplinary nature of uh, method, the process going into what is what is interdisciplinary. And my, my question has to do more with the audience and thinking about when you are producing your work, do you really find yourself um, really trying to the, what audience do you favor? Does the secondary audience that you borrow from, are they even able to understand or appreciate your work necessarily? And, and, and kind of what I'm thinking about is, yes, borrowing is, is necessary for the act of creating, but maybe are we just, is, is it really interdisciplinary when we're really just trying to favor one side? And how has how that affected how you think about your projects? That was for Oh, I didn't. You said only one person. Oh yeah, but I don't know. Oh, so someone take the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I feel uh, um, a little. I feel like I have a different relationship to method, or or a sense of a standard method. Um, in the, in that, it's kind of it's definitely amorphous in choreography, and, and so in choreographic research as well. It's kind of. Yes, we look at okay. This was how this was made. If we have that, if we have access to that information, or in conversation. Um, but you know, I think of the, this piece that I'm do, um, doing currently called Structure of Us, and this is the one I was referring to. I, we have uh, I'm working with a, uh, I'm working with another choreographer, performer, and a visual artist, um, and so we're doing the site specific performance. And there was assumption of there's three dancers because we decided that all three of us were going to be present in the space. Uh, Kitty, the visual artist, was was doing uh, producing her work on, on the spot while we were kind of all interacting, and so the boundaries of like who's doing what and what of expectation, right, um, was really confusing because for her audience, right, we had this um, it was the Fringe Festival in Rochester, and so we were close to uh, SUNY Brockport where both of my collaborators worked, so we had a dance audience of students and an art audience of students. We had a community that goes to the French Festival and they just say, oh, that sounds cool, let me go, right? And so you have this kind of flux of people. And so what that did, I think, was there was a collision of expectation of how to see this, this experience, how to experience it as an audience. Um, and for us, we were making with that in mind heavily. But again, it's only it's only conjecture, right? Well, if they do this, we could, we could respond this way. If they end up just lining up along the wall, which they did, um, how do we position it, right? So I think um, I think that it, the framing of it, of interdisciplinary work, yeah, it should absolutely include the, the collision of audience from different fields, because that's then each person learns a little bit more about the other. Um, and I think that's kind of, you have to like learn through Thank you. Um, now only one of you would be able to answer. <laughs> um, I was I um, was curious about um, what you carry, what disciplinary baggage you carry. So better for you when you're visiting all these places and go. I mean, the things that won't make it into the book because you know they're they're. There are certain things that you won't talk about in the fallout. Uh, Lila, in your case, you have this, you know, the virtual world is full of infinite resources where revolutionaries act under severe scarcity. So you know, if, if, if there's a difference there, with the disciplines in your cases I saw as limiting. Whereas for Jerry and Brandon, it seems like it could be productive 
if masculinity is a social imprint, then movement and form of the body, the dance brings to it is really an undoing. In Virginia, I'm so struck by the, your board games as architectural. You know, it's, it's, it's really about it. So I'm just curious about how the disciplines actually have a shadowy presence in your interdisciplinarity. Well, I think I, I can, um, I, interestingly enough, that you asked this question and I would answer you if you noticed the academic genealogy began with English literature. <laughs> it did. Um, and so what happened to me was my my freshman year in college, I had started at an engineering college, but the culture there was way too masculine and too not me. You know, as a, an eight, 17 year old, I couldn't handle the, right? <laughs> Funny. So um, it's eight, 1989 and I went, so I ended up doing English literature and studying uh, form and um, literary theory and encountering Donna Haraway and encountering Aristotle and encountering, encountering literary theory and formal principles from like close reading of the text. Um, and that has stuck with me forever. All the other stuff was, to, was not as formative. I have to say, all the graduate work is not quite as deep. There's something about that undergraduate um, study that has left that imprint that's that's deep. Does that? Oh, no, the last person. Question. <laughs> now we're going to have a reception. Oh, Vashkar. I don't want to know what Vashkar has to ask. <laughs> OK, so uh, I was wondering throughout about intradisciplinarity as a source of interdisciplinary frictions. Intradisciplinary. Well, mm -hmm. you actually brought it up in some ways, you know, already. But I was just thinking, we come from, Lala and I come from film and media studies. It used to be film studies. Then it became, many places, film and television studies. That was not enough. Then it became film media studies. Now we are film media, new media. <laughs> you know, like the proliferation of media forms. <laughs> I mean, I often joke at Vishnu, you're in an English department. You, you have a position for every eight years, right? Late modern, late early modern, early late early modern, and on and on. So, I mean, that kind of internal boundaries that proliferate, right? Uh, that also produces a significant amount of friction. And I'm wondering if what Vishnu is talking about as limitations and productivities really are not the same thing. Hmm. You know, if, if the internal and the out, outside border seem to have similar effects. Hmm. I think for my field that it's very easy to identify those interdisciplinary boundaries. History is a vast subject, but we tended to silo in place and time. And more traditional departments are definitely like that. And I think that what has happened to us, I can only speak from experience here at UCSB, what has happened to us over the past maybe 10, 15 years is that we've become more receptive to theoretical approaches to history that are not just, you know, wrong in, in, in nature. But it's that it's, it's that those theoretical approaches now that have allowed us to, to sort of take English as our model and to, to reorganize around thematic clusters instead of place and, and period. And so, um, so those, those boundaries, the, those borders are real. But I think we have found a certain amount of joy in finding tools that allow us to hop back and forth over them. So it's, I think we like to sit still in it, but I think we like to, to socialize outside of them. And, and we were kind of hungry to find things that would help us do that, and maybe we have. And on that note, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you for coming, and invite us all to our reception. So thank you. Thank you.